this morning. It's good to see you guys. Looks like family. We got a lot of people traveling and stuff, but uh, we have some prayer requests at the end of service, and uh, we'll do that. And if anybody needs prayer, we're going to do that today too. So did anybody enjoy week one of All Are Stirred by the Gospel? Yeah. Wasn't it good? Yeah. I mean, that's what, we, that's, what we're, that's what we're called to do, right? This is what we're called to preach. It's what we're called to spread. It's what we're called to live. And so that's what Jesus calls us to do, is to stir up by the gospel. And so last week, we'll do a little quick recap. We talked about souls, right? We talked about three different types of, of what it does. We talked about how people will deny it more, but that's okay. They have a free choice. Um, and then they, uh, they, 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 uh, we also talked about people that accept it, but they maybe not truly really live it. You get my drift? And then thirdly, we talked about the one, the one that receives it in their heart. But keep in mind, all three can still change because Jesus changes everything. And so, matter of fact, if you think about week one when we preach this, do you know that uh, you sometimes people go through all those stages? I have. And so I'm not. What so? I guess I should have clarified that last week because the kind of the Holy Ghost put that on my heart. But my point is, in the long run, all hearts are stirred by the gospel. Can somebody say Amen? The gospel of Jesus Christ that He came down. That he ca the only begotten Son came down, right, to this earth from heavenly hosts and heavenly places, and that he healed the sick, he set the captives free, he made the, he made the blind see, and, and he also corrected what was wrong in, in the world because he had the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he came and preached that, and then he raised up disciples and told them to go. But the number one thing about the gospel is he got up on that cross for each and every person, not just a couple people, not just church people. He came for the one out there uh, that's smoking meth this morning, and it, the same thing for me up here behind the pulpit. Because I've been in both positions. And we're going to talk about that today because that's what Paul is. But I want to tell you something. There is power, wonder-working power, in the blood of the Lamb. It come, He came and He got on that cross. And He bled for each and every one of us. And the pure gospel is this, that He, went, that he, he, he did die. You see, oh yeah, you know, you hear, I've heard, I hear so many people preach that. No, he died, but he defeated death, and he said there is no sting in death anymore. And so the blood defeated sin, the blood defeated death, the blood defeated depression, the blood defeated anything you were going through. Sickness, he said, by my stripes you are healed. And I'm telling you, and then he said, I'm going to raise up out of that tomb, and he did. On the third day, he walked out of that tomb. And he appeared to the world. He appeared to many. And you can't deny the gospel when you hear it because it just hits your heart. Then he said, I'm going to go back to the Father on the right hand and I'm praying and interceding for you. And the most beautiful thing is, guess what? He's prepared a place for you. So whatever this life throws at you, he's already got a place prepared for you. So I have nothing to fear. And if you have him in your heart this morning, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now how's that for a recap? Let's get into week two. You see, week one was special. Why? Because this message is special. <laughs> it's the most powerful message ever. And you have to get that in your heart. It's, it's called pure hope. And, and it's also uh, the way. We talked about the. there's a broad way and there's a narrow way. The world goes the broad way, but you've got to stay in the narrow way. And, and, and actually, they talk about paths, right, in different translations. But then Jesus gives the answer, I'm the way. I am the truth. I am the life now, more abundantly and, and eternally. It's so amazing. I love the gospel. It's the good news. Did it just fill your heart with goodness last week when we preached it? We're going to get some more of this, and it's going to be a little different. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the foundation of it all. Everything you see within this church, within our uh, whatever we do for the community, whatever we do in the future, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the foundation of it all. Period. It's the free gift of God to a hurting world. 
There's a hurting world out there. They need a Savior. And we have to spread it. We have to tell them, we have found the answer, and it is Jesus Christ. And it takes your past, He takes your past sins and mistakes, and He remembers them no more. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Jesus, for that. He separates them from the east to the west. He forgets them. You're the one that holds on to them. Quit holding on to them. And, he, and then he tells you, leave the old things because I'm bringing you into new things. Paul gives an amazing breakdown of what it means to accept the gospel, to be truly saved, to be made truly whole, and to be born again. And I want to talk about it, Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I want you to see this as I read. Among them, we too all, all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Are you seeing where he's, he said this is where you're coming from. Everybody's failed. You're born into sin. The sin, the world's deformed. But the Savior comes to transform. And so Paul's breaking it out. This is what you were. But you're not that anymore because he said this. He said in verse 4, But God, man, I should just preach that. I think that's going to be a sermon one day. But God. That's a powerful statement right there. And I'll show you why. Being rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised up with him. Here it is. That's, listen, Paul. now Paul's describing it. He said, by grace and the love of Jesus, didn't he say, uh, God so loved the world? God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son. All you got to do is believe, baby. And verse 7, so that, in, 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 I'm sorry, 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You now have a position change, not just from sin to new life. Listen to me. Not just from death to new life, from death to life. You have a position change from the world now to heavenly places. So he does this, 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 and that. That's beautiful. I love how Paul broke down that word. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now he's telling you, this is how you better not live. And then in verse 10, this is my favorite. For we are his workmanship. Matter of fact, other translations said you are his masterpiece. You ought to say, can somebody say I am a masterpiece? I am Jesus' workmanship. Yes, say it. It's beautiful. Created in Christ Jesus for good works in which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, everything. Paul then describes it. He brings it all the way back around and he said, God created you for a purpose. Can somebody say amen? He said, all you got to do is believe and then you walk into the good things that I have prepared for you and then you change the world because I already had it prepared. Now, that's a good breakdown of one of my favorite passages right there. What an amazing thing. Truly, it's, take, it's, it's called taking uh, my first sermon I ever preached when I got out of rehab in jail. My dad told me, I want you to preach this morning. It was called Death to Life. Matter of fact, I stole Notorious B.I.G.'s rap cover because it was, a, it was a hearst and it said from death to life. And I changed the rap lyrics, I mean, I changed the message of it up, and it was on the overhead screen. And Dad was like, oh, that's pretty cool, but whatever. <laughs> and then you know what I did? I had pill bottles in my hand, and I wrapped a chain around my neck. Are you hearing me? See, I, was, I had it all planned out, man. I stole rap CDs, changed it up on the overhead, man. I had chains around my neck. I had pill bottles in my hand. 
And guess what? Jesus took all that and all that chains fell off of me. And he made me a new creation and the old things were gone and new things came. That's the gospel. This change changes the atmosphere around us too. This message changes cities. So I want, to, I want to hear amens on this one. This message changes communities. This message changes regions. It changes states. And it's going to change a nation. This message changes the world. Period. The gospel stirs up everything, though. Hearts, churches, the enemy. Oh, ho, ho. it stirs up the enemy. Do you know what kind of opposition when you get when you start preaching the truth? That's why you got to be grounded in, in the word and grounded in prayer. And you're still going to have a rough time, baby, because the enemy gets stirred up. But you can tell the enemy to get thee behind me. That's why we preach it continually. Point number one, from enemy to unashamed. Let's look at the life of Paul. How he was stirred. How his position changed in his life. Acts 9.1. Now Saul, I want you to pay attention to what I just said. Why am I using two different names right there? Y'all know, but I'm going to explain it. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, verse 2, and asked for letters from him to synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, Ooh, I love that right there. Let's pause right there. I belong to the way. I belong to the truth. I belong to the life. But Paul was searching for the ones that belong to the way. Who, who is he talking about? The ones that were trying to spread this gospel message. Both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul was a hitman for the Sanhedrin council. He was binding and persecuting Christians. And then we think we have it hard. I'm just tired, Pastor, this morning. I'm going to stay home. <laughs> then people were getting captured. Then people were getting bound and tortured and crucified. First off, I love this, belonging to the way. Remember last week, there are two ways. The broad way to destruction and the narrow way to the gate. Jesus answered, he said, I am the way. I am the way. And you belong to the way this morning. So we have Saul, a little hitman, seizing early Christians. Many paid the price because of this man. Do you see what he did? Did you know that? But one day, Acts 9.3, as he was traveling, oh, here we go, he was traveling. He was traveling, and it says, It happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Four, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Boy, he knew that he was Lord, though, didn't he? You see that? He didn't say, Who are you? Who's talking to me? He knew who he was talking to. See, you can deny Jesus, but let me explain something to you. You already know who you're talking to. <laughs> this is a good sermon. And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But see, Jesus changes everything. Acts 9, 7. The men who traveled with him stood speechless. <laughs> I bet they did, brother. I bet they did. Would you be speechless? I'd probably be breaking myself getting somewhere. Hearing the voice but seeing no one, Saul got up from the ground and through his eyes were open. He could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank because he had the fear of the Lord within him. I added that. When you have scales on your eyes, brothers and sisters, you're going to be scared. When Jesus breaks you down so hard with his light and you fall down to the ground, you're going to be scared. And when the Lord talks from heaven to you, you get my drift? Acts 9, 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying the hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. 
and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized. 19, check it out. And he took food and was strengthened. Saul began to preach Christ now for several days, and he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. Within a three-day period, he said, I'm, I take you from a hit man that's persecuting me and my church and my people, and I make you preach the gospel, boy. I've got the power because I already said I designed you for good works. You just didn't know about it. Now you see why Paul wrote Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Because he knew. Acts 9, 20. And he immediately began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. Do you think they hated that man? From paying him to persecuting Christians to preaching in the synagogue? Now you understand why he went through persecution. 21. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who were called on his name? and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Yes, that was, brothers and sisters. And Jesus changes everything. He takes a dirty pill addict with no hope that lost everything, and he said, I want you to go launch a church in a town in Texas, and you just proclaim the gospel and do what I called you to do. Within just a few days, Saul was made new, made whole, found his true purpose. He ended up writing 90% of the New Testament. You see, Saul then changed his own name after this ordeal to Paul. You know why? He was a new creation in Christ. Maybe you ought to give yourself a new name. I'm not talking literally. Like I'm not going to change my name to, you know, a crazy name. But you get my mindset. You know, I'm talking about your heart. You're not who you used to be. And, and guess what? Those patterns try to come back and catch up with you, and you've got to get behind them. You've got to change it up. You know what? I'm going to change my name to a new creation. Pastor New Creation. That might work. I'm going to just tell myself that every morning. Good morning, Pastor New Creation. You're looking good, boy. Shining teeth with a wash rag and stuff. He wrote this too after this. He said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. He was unashamed from then on. He said it's the power. It's the power that changed me and I'm going to go tell the world. Amazing, isn't it? It's called being stirred up by the gospel. Then change, uh, he was changed to a new creation in Christ, so very so that I want you to see this, that in one book in Ephesians alone, he proclaimed in Christ 33 times, and then the rest of the New Testament, he proclaimed in Christ in his writing 168 times. What does that mean? Whatever true of Christ is true of you. That's called the in Christ principle. I have been crucified with Christ. It is I that no longer live, but Christ that liveth within me. Paul knew it in his heart. He said, I'm in Christ now. He now belonged to the way. <laughs> Point number two, spreading it. Paul stirred people up everywhere he went with the gospel. The truth spread wherever he was, traveling, working, visiting homes, prisons, the government, the streets, and especially the ones who were lost and needed it. Through suffering, trials, and heartaches, he never relented. Not once. He never quit. He said, I fought the good fight. Always going forward with the gospel. All right, let's check this out. Paul went through it too in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. I want you to read that. Let me get a drink of water. Sorry. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. His life thus revolved around spreading the gospel and he had pure faith and resolve and that's what we have to have in our heart and our mindset as believers. 
You see, Paul's missionary journeys helped spread the gospel throughout much of the ancient world. Over the course of his ministry, the Apostle Paul traveled more than 10,000 miles and established 14 churches, and that's what changed the world. Mm. The message of the good news spread throughout the world, and it's still spreading this morning because it's proclaiming out of our mouth into the hill country of Texas. You see, the gospel affects the one, and then it affects the households, and then the entire families and friends get it. Then it affects cities, communities, and entire regions. Can somebody say amen? Acts 13, 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. As we preach this truth, it's spread throughout the whole region. Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Wow. That's how important it is to spread the gospel. Everybody has to hear it. Somebody has to preach, proclaim, and spread it to be effective. And that takes us as believers to do this. Then you will see the world stirred up and changed. That a Savior came to earth and bled for each of us. That He died upon a cross willingly. That His blood covered all your past, present, and future sin. He defeated death and then He said, I'm going back to heaven. Then he rose on the third day in a dark tomb, changed his believers to go. He charged his believers to go. Go spread it out throughout the world, making disciples, baptizing them. That's what we're doing. Knowing that by reaching one at a time, that this message would flood communities with love, areas with love, areas with hope, regions with hope, changing nations throughout the world, and eventually the entire world would see it. Beautiful. I love this message today. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I read this at a young age, and it's kind of weird how I read this at a young age, but it's a quote by Napoleon, of all people. And it says, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest through creations of our genius? He said, upon force. But then Napoleon goes on to say, Jesus Christ founded his entire empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Now, that's a quote. That quote has always stuck with me. Even Napoleon knew. That's well said. So very true, the gospel resonates the love of Jesus, and that's a force and fire that will never be extinguished. Point number three. Is somebody enjoying this this morning? Amen. Stirring goes deeper. Back to what Paul described in our original text. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we all too formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Notice verse 2. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Think about that for a minute. What does that look like to you? kind of looks like our nation right now, doesn't it? Think about that. You know why? Because they're trying to take God out of schools, the government, program, courthouses. They are operating under the spirit of the sons of disobedience. Well, that is replaced by the spirit of confusion and chaos when they do that. And remember last week, it's either Christ in your life or chaos in your life. Now you see it, don't you? Communities, cities, region, even states change from godly to ungodly. I'm going to show you a few examples. Austin, Texas is a great example. Chicago is another one. New York is another one. San Francisco is really bad. You see, the list goes on and on, and you can see the oppression upon these cities. I'm preaching now. You see, look at California. Look at New Mexico. Look at Colorado. And so many more. You see, these states have the highest amount of depression, addiction, suicide, and crime. Tell me why. Oppressed. 
Because the lax laws that proclaim more freedom for people actually enslaves more people when you take God out of the element. This is called the truth this morning. It's a spiritual thing. There is no doubt. That's where the good news comes in, though. Preaching Christ, which is the only true hope. We've had a high spiritual attack and warfare in this region. Seven years I've battled spiritually before I even launched this church. Four years and three years of being pastor. And I've never seen more spiritual attacks in my life. Why? Because it's bound by religious spirits. It's bound by new age spirits. It's bound by witchcraft, false religions, tradition, and nasty spirits in high places. And I say we rebuke that in the mighty name of Jesus. And there is this a house of power. This is a house of hope. This is a house of the Lord where his presence rests and the Shekinah glory stays over it and people drive by and they have to be moved by the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But listen, Acts 17, 10. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. We have come by the proclamation of the Jesus Christ and the Great Commission, and we are going to see people set free. We are positioned right here to stir this community up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We press on like Paul. We don't relent. We hold fast to our faith. We build their foundations that cannot be shaken. We press in on year three, knowing that God will move on our half, and all we got to do is keep reaching the one. That's it. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Boy, I went through this one. I thought this sucker was going to be about an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm cooking this morning. <coughs> Doctor told me, boy, you can't preach so hard on Sundays you're tearing your throat up. I said, well, Jesus is my healer. <clears throat> and if my throat's tore up, then guess what? I'm going to keep preaching as loud as I can, baby. Jesus he'll be. Jesus healed me. I'm going to keep preaching. I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I can't help but getting excited. I don't come up here and make a show to get y'all pumped up. I know that the Savior saved my life from nothing and maybe something. And I don't boast in myself because I had nothing to do with it. I boast in him because of his great love and his rich mercy. This is good, ain't it? Don't you ever forget what you see in this nation and around us right now? You need to get up in the morning and say, greater than he that is in me, than he that is in the world. If you're going through th something and it's weighing on your mind, you're worried about something, you cast that down and say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You walk out there and you face that enemy eye to eye because you have the power and they must go. They must flee. All you got to do is believe it and tell them. Closing. Y'all going to get y'all make it today, boy. But my clothes are long. <laughs> y'all ain't laughing now. Like, I, really was, you know, I was laughing a while ago. But. Now back to our text because here's why. I'm, I'm, I'm hammering this. I want you to know I'm hammering Ephesians 2. God being rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us. What a scripture. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now let's unpack this. See, there's the hope and answer right there. His love rescues people and he, then he makes them truly alive. They thought they were enjoying themselves in the world. There's nothing like when Jesus comes into your life. You see, clear, you see new things. Life carries on a whole new perspective for you. And then we are raised up and seated with him in heavenly places. Now do you believe greater in he that is in you than he that it is in the world? Because the enemy is trying to bring you low. He said, I don't let, let him do that because I already got you high. And when that happens, Aryan regions are truly affected by heavenly places. You know Why? Because we're already heavenly citizens. Right here on earth. That's the sit in your heart, what I just said just then. 
It's all, we're already heavenly citizens. And so we have to bring that heavenly approach in Texas as it is in heaven. I read that every time I walk into the church and I believe it with my full heart. Listen close, Ephesians 2, 7. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You see, this is talking about the abundant life that hits now on earth that's full of blessings, but he, that doesn't even cover the whole thing because eternity is way longer than our little life that we have right now. Our life is like a vapor. It's like a little dust hit. Because it's super dry right now, and I look down the road, and you see the dust. That's how, that, your life is short. Eternity is way longer. That's why we had to get this gospel out to people. Then, Ephesians 2.8, For by the grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Well, then now, we had nothing to do with it but just believe. That's it. But you got to believe. You got to say it with your mouth and confess it with your heart. And then we brag on Jesus and spread the gospel. Always after the one, always stirring hearts to make a decision because now we're calling people to the line. A decision must be made when you preach the gospel. It must be. And then my favorite part For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Now, is your heart stirred this morning? You see, he knew it all along. Boy, at times in your life, you didn't feel like it, did you? I sure didn't. I had no hope. And then he says, then I created you and filled you with hope and gave you fresh life. You are his handiwork. His handiwork, his workmanship. You are his masterpiece this morning. And I'm telling the lost online and whoever's here today and who's ever grocery shopping over there in the parking lot and all through Blaco in the hill country that your heart will be stirred by the gospel. And so go walk in the gifts that he's given you and hold fast to your faith. Don't grow weary in doing good. Stand firm and never back down. Do not grow weary in doing good. Don't let the enemy wear you out. Because this message must be spread to all. All ears and they will hear. Now they might deny it. They might not truly live it. But that one will get saved. But guess what? There's hope for all three that I described last week. Because I was one. But I'm going to go back to verse 10. You know that you were called to do this. You were born to do it for such a time as this. Maybe perhaps you were born for a time as this. Does that ring a bell with you? Esther 4.14 For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for America... Did you read that? Relief and deliverance for Blanco and Johnson City. Relief and deliverance for the hill country of Texas. Relief and deliverance for the people that smoke meth, that have no hope, for the people that shoot up, that have no hope, for people that are depressed, for people that are diseased, for people that hold on to their past, for suicidal thoughts. He said relief and depression will not go anywhere if you don't say that Jesus is the answer. And it will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. But I love this part. And who knows that you have come to your royal position. <laughs> come on, somebody. For a time as this. Do you know what that means? You are in a priesthood. He has taken you from nothing to something and placed you in heavenly places. You are part of the royal king's bloodline. Somebody tell me something. And then he says, you have come to a royal position for a time as this. Perhaps you were born for a time as this. And Jesus, thank you because I'm going to see the move. 
Now that's what you call preaching the gospel. From death to life. From the fires of hell to a royal priesthood. From nothing to be called into the family of God. From no hope to full of hope. From no power to full of power. And Jesus has got to do it. You just got to stand firm and keep rocking. And I'm telling you today, he has showed me he is going to move powerfully. You just got to not grow weary of doing good, boy. And I'm telling you, each that are sitting here today and online, go on with Christ and spread the gospel and save the one. And if it's five in your lifetime, then that's five more that didn't go to hell. If you need hope this morning, this gospel I've been preaching for two weeks and then Dad's going to come and cap this off, wow. I spoke to him this morning when he called me. I'm super excited. Something's going to change when you preach like this, you understand me? It cannot say neutral. <laughs> it's going to move. But Jesus is the answer and we found him. It's the void that fills your life up. And it all starts with Jesus. And the Bible tells us in John 14, 6, I'm going to say it again for the fourth time today. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Mohammed died. <laughs> Buddha died. All the other false religions died. They rotted. You hear, you hear me? But only one king can say, I'm still alive. I think that's something pretty powerful. Do you know why? I spoke to him this morning. As simply as I talked to my dad on the phone, I spoke to Jesus. Because I believe. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is say it with your mouth. And confess it with your heart. You must accept Jesus into your heart first and simply believe that he did that for you on the cross and that he rose again because he loves you that much. Everybody please bow your heads. If you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and would like to this morning, please raise your hand. Boy, we had people saved last week. Hearts just have to take the truth. Online, if you're watching, if you need Jesus, Jesus is waiting on you. Decide today to live for Jesus. Today is your day of salvation. Let's all say this prayer. Repeat it with me. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm in need of you. That you died on the cross for me that you rose on the third day for me. This morning, this very day, I would like to experience your mercy in my life. I ask you today to come into my heart and truly change me. No religious games. No, nothing that I've ever experienced before. I ask you to give me true change, to make me a new creation that the old things are gone and that you bring new things into my life to fill me, to heal me with the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for loving me and giving me new hope in you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Go on, let me go on the hand this morning. There is nothing like proclaiming, speaking, and filling the atmosphere and areas filled with the gospel of Christ. Nothing like it. That's what we're going to do. That's what we always do. And that's a vision of this church. The first thing it says is preaching the gospel simply, loving on people relentlessly. Because like Napoleon said, you can try to win the world, but Jesus has already won the world with his love. Isn't that beautiful? Can I pray for you all this morning?
Father, we thank you for this powerful message of truth. We thank you and we proclaim it. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for we are building a foundation that cannot be shaken. And we ask, Lord, we ask of you, Lord, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we develop more of a prayer life, that we can reach the, reach the community. And we thank you to bring the one to us. Bring that sheep that is lost, Father, and bring him to us, and we'll just preach the message and put them on your shoulder and carry them back to where they need to be, Jesus. And we thank you for all these wonderful people here today, online. I ask you to bless them, Lord. This week, just come fill them with a fresh peace that the world cannot understand, that they have the peace of Jesus in their life. I ask of you to shine your countenance upon them, to bless them, and to fill them with peace this, this week. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.